Hello everybody, or whoever is there already. Ciao, ciao, I'm here in the wine room. I'm gonna join myself and put my phone on silent. We have Lisa the joint, hey Lisa. Ciao my darling. We have Dave the joint, thank you. We have your father from Firenze. You stayed away, thank you Babo. I have Tommy trying to tell me things there and I have no idea what he's telling me. Oh, cheers then with something. Yes. Okay, I'll cheer with you. Sorry, Tommy. I don't do well with gestures language. Okay, everybody, we're on course number one, I'm sorry, class number one of Petra's amazing Passport to Italy Italian wine course. And these are going to be some of the wines that she is discussing today. I'll go by here quickly. There we go. You may want to turn your volume down completely. Yeah. There we go. And she'll be talking about these, uh, but in particular tasting those, which she's going to talk about in a moment. And then she's going to be today talking about... Let me point No, not there. No, not there. We're going to be up here in Piemonte. Awesome. Petra, take it away. Okay. Class number one. Class number one. So, uh, first of all, thank you everybody for being here. I'm hoping to um, give you something fun to do on this beautiful sunny Tuesday afternoon. Um, the first thing I want to uh, tell you is that for those of you that got the wine skit from Solare, so you should have your bottle of Gabi, hopefully chilled already, and the bottle of uh, Nebbiolo uh, Michele Chiarlo. Please go ahead while you listen to me, make sure the two bottles are open that you're ready with your glasses. I would recommend that you also have, because we're gonna talk about the color of the wines, a white paper, a white surface, something that can help you look at the color, the, the, the site, and uh, we're gonna analyze that a little bit. So make sure there's a white paper floating around. Also, another recommendation, if you're able to have a computer also on while you're doing the class with me, I would recommend you to have, um, the uh, uh, map of Piemonte and if you go on a website that's called Wine Folly and you type Piemonte you find a beautiful wine map there that kind of has uh, like it divides with the little numbers the areas of production of specific wines um, and um, yeah so please go ahead and see if you can pull up a map of uh, Piemonte so that you can follow me better okay Looking here if there's any questions so far, doesn't look like it. So again, I might repeat some information again, like making sure that you're ready with your wine kit, but we're gonna get to tasting the two wines that you got on the kit at the end of the class. So first I'm gonna start with uh, generic information about Piemonte. I don't have a lot of time. Again, we're trying to keep these, uh, these lives uh, to uh, a minimum, uh, so half an hour. This one might, might go a little bit over just because I want to give you some tasting indication too, but then we're going to try to really keep it at 30 minutes. So today, because it's the first one, there might be a little extra information that probably I won't need to repeat the next times. So bear with me. If you need to go, you go. And again, remember that these videos will be eventually available on our YouTube channel. So you can always look at them again and use them when you retaste the same type of wine that we're tasting today, in case you didn't get the kit. You can still get it, okay? So if you did not get the kit for today, but you still wanna taste the Gavi and the Nebbiolo with Solare, then just call us. Uh, we have more of these wines. You can get the kit tomorrow or in the future days, and then look at the video on YouTube and taste the wines with me, okay? So today, class number one, Piemonte, okay? Are you ready to virtually go to Piemonte with me? I'm gonna start with a first question for those who already joined. Who has been to Piemonte? Is there anybody in the crowd that is following the live today that has been there? I'd like to know how many. Raise your hand in the comments if you did. Oh, I see somebody who definitely been there, Bataziolo. Ciao Stefano, thank you for joining. I mean, that's, uh, this is Stefano Poggi, he represents uh, Bataziolo in um, 
California and other areas uh, of uh, North America and um, is definitely a very, very knowledgeable person about Piemonte wines because that's where Battaziolo is located. So they produce uh, Gavi, Barbera, uh, uh, Dolcetto, they produce uh, Barolo, Barbaresco. So uh, definitely a good name to remember uh, uh, for uh, Piemonte wines, Battaziolo, okay? We're not gonna taste any of the wines today, but if I could give you a, a little piece of advice, definitely a name that you wanna add to your must try Piemonte wines. Hold on, Randy stole my, my Sharpie, but I am gonna write this name on a piece of paper and show it to you. Battaziolo. And then maybe I'll get the Sharpie back. There, he, he heard me and the Sharpie came back. So Battaziolo wines, we definitely we are a big fan, done a lot of dinners with Stefano and the wines, uh, and we will hopefully start to do more of those dinners soon again. Now, Piemonte. Um, so we are, uh, you can't see the map now from how the uh, phone is set up and I'm not able to move that, but you are in the northwestern part of uh, Italy, okay? And pardon me if you look at me, uh, if you see me looking somewhere else and I lose eye contact with you, but I'm following some notes to make sure that I go quickly, give you the right information and, um, and don't forget anything. Um, so please forgive me about that. Uh, the goal is to give you kind of a overview of the region uh, uh, and uh, kind of introduce the most important wines that come from this region. And of course, questions are welcome. And then we're gonna taste the two wines. And again, repeating this now, if you did get the kit, make sure that the Gavi Broglia and the Michele Chiarlo uh, Nebbiolo are ready to go and open, okay? I hope to see some thumbs up that you're ready to go with your kit. And again, this is so funny because I'm looking at myself on my phone here to look at your questions, which is like at least uh, 30 seconds delayed, so it's funny. Uh, anyways, okay, let's get going. Uh, Piedmont or Piemonte, okay? Um, Piedmont would be the English uh, name of it, Piemonte in Italian. Piemonte means at the uh, foot of the mountain. Piede means foot in Italian. Uh, monte is the word for mountain. So at the foot of the mountain, that's uh, what the name of the region means. And uh, so that kind of already tells you a little bit about the territory. So you are right underneath uh, the Northern Alps, but you are also, there's a, you're also not too far from the Mediterranean. So Piemonte make it, makes it all the way down, Western part, uh, it almost down to the coast uh, of the Mediterranean, not too far from Liguria, okay? So I hope you guys were able to open a map of the region to understand where it is located geographically, because that has a huge role uh, in terms of the wine that are produced in this region, uh, because you're gonna have the cold weather and winds coming from the northern side, even though the, up, uh, the Alps uh, kind of uh, work as a beautiful shield for very, very bad weather coming from the north. And then you have this maritime um, influence coming from uh, the Medi Mediterranean uh, uh, Sea on the southern area. Now, Piemonte, I'd say, touristically, it's, it's not Tuscany, or it's not at the level uh, of uh, Tuscany in terms of how many people go there. Uh, for, I don't know why, if you ask me. Uh, but it is a very, very mystic and uh, amazing region to visit. So if uh, you've been to Italy many times, but you still haven't made it up there, you still haven't experienced uh, a drive in the Lange area, uh, or in the Monferrato, or in the Alta Langa, which are all very uh, specific and important areas of Piemonte, well, you should put that uh, in your list of uh, things to do because you, you would love it. Um, Piemonte is also an amazing uh, culinary uh, region, like uh, definitely a region where food is a little bit heavier, uh, to mention certain um, specific foods that you're gonna find there. Of course, the land of truffle. We all know about the beautiful white truffle coming from Alba uh, and mushrooms in general. So you're gonna find a lot of that in their cuisine, risottos, um, definitely the land of risotto, uh, risot um, so rice-based dish, then uh, broth, uh, beef, 
Uh, Piemonte is uh, a region where one of the most important breed of cattle is uh, uh, raised, and which is the Piemontese uh, breed. One, it's it's uh, considered to be one of the highest level of beef you can possibly get in Italy. And then you have uh, a specific sauce that's called bagna cauda, anchovy based, uh, a beautiful sauce that you can use, for example, to top out a crudo of fish or some other vegetable items. So it is a very specific cuisine that definitely was influenced by the uh, by, by the, the Frenchie being there. So a lot of use of cheese, butter. It's a heavy heavy cuisine. If I were to uh, compare it for, to a cuisine that I'm very familiar with, so Toscan cuisine, definitely the Piemonte cuisine would be more on a heavier, sturdy kind of um, um, way, okay? If that makes sense. Looking here, if there's any questions that I should reply, taking a second. No, we're good. Okay, then um, in terms of uh, uh, the history of Piemonte as a winemaking region, uh, first of all, it dates very far back. Uh, so Piemonte, historically, it's definitely on the top three uh, quality wine uh, producing uh, regions. I'd say uh, that the other two that you want to list first would be Tuscany and Veneto on the same kind of level of Piemonte, but Piemonte even more so is specifically famous, as you possibly know, for which huge and amazing red wines? Let's see who replies. Yeah, it is colder. Yes, uh, Stefano, definitely a colder region. Agree. Not as Tuscany, different microclimate. So definitely a continental uh, kind of climate up in Piemonte, okay? With some marit maritime influences, but still, you can call it definitely continental. Correct me if I'm wrong. Yes, so let's see. Lisa, may your answer? Barolo, yes. So, um, Piemonte is mostly famous for his Barolos and Barbaresco, the two big bees uh, produced in this region. But not only, there's so much more to it. Uh, again, being a region that is focused on quality wines, I remember in the previous sessions we talked about uh, the, uh, this, uh, the appellation system in Italy. So Piemonte, along with another region that we're actually going to cover on Thursday, it's uh, the only other region that has no IGTs. So Piemonte has just uh, DOC and DOCGs, and a lot of them. It's actually the region with the most amount of DOCGs, okay? Uh, for, uh, to, be, to be exact, 17 total and then a lot of uh, DOCs as well, but absolutely no IGTs. That means that Piemonte, um, to give you an idea of what that means, it's a real uh, terroir-driven uh, region, okay? So that we're uh, terroir, where you're growing a certain variety um, compared to another one, it's really, really important. And uh, I would say that Piemonte, in terms of how the area is, uh, uh, divided and the organization of the DOC and DOCGs is possibly the closest realities to Burgundy that we find in Italy. The first place where the concept of cruise, of single vineyard, actually started. Okay, and then there's other areas of Italy where now this is developing, but Piemonte was definitely the first one. So this is very important. Let me once in a while I'm gonna take a quick break and look at possible questions. Okay, so what I, I have here, you can see them on the you can see them on the video, but I'm gonna show you other bottles to talk because to, today we're gonna focus on two specific varieties, both native varieties of Piemonte, which are uh, Cortese, which is the grape uh, that you uh, that makes Gavi. So one of those cases where the name of the wine doesn't doesn't necessarily correspond to the variety. So in this case, you have a wine that's called. Gavi di Gavi, or simply Gavi, and it refers to the town, the area around which this wine is produced, nothing to do with the grape. The grape that is in Gavi, it's actually called Cortese, C-O-R-T-E-S-E, -E, Cortese, okay? And the other wine that we're going to find, uh, that we're going to try is the Nebbiolo, right here. I'm not going to move it because it's holding my phone. Uh, and that's definitely the, even if it's not the most planted variety in Piemonte, which is actually Barbera, it is the most important one, the noble grape uh, planted in this region. So we're going to try this, two, these two wines, but there's a lot more 
uh, to say about uh, native uh, varieties of Piemonte. Um, one little parenthesis about that, Piemonte, because of uh, the French influence and the fact that uh, um, the, um, the crown of France has been in the area for quite a bit, uh, it's one of the regions where a lot of native varietals uh, actually were taken away and substituted with uh, uh, non-native varieties, such as uh, Chardonnay, for example, or Pinot Noir in certain areas. Uh, so it's not uncommon in Piemonte to find also plantings of international varieties. I will not focus on that too much, but you definitely want to, when you talk about the spe a specific area of Piemonte that's called Alta Langa, which means the northern area of Piemonte, you do find a lot of plantings of uh, Chardonnay and uh, Pinot Noir over there, which contribute to production of the mostly sparkling wines, just so you know. And they're very, very, very fine, fun wines. Uh, most of them produced with the uh, Metodo Classico, so Champenoise Method, and that's something you would find in the area called the Alta Lange. Um, okay, so to show you some of these other varieties, because uh, unfortunately we can't taste all of them today together, but I wanna make sure you know that those exist. In terms of native uh, varieties, uh, beside the Cortese that we're gonna taste today, I'd say that the two that uh, deserve a big attention would be those. One is Nascetta, that is definitely doing a coming back now in terms of production in Piemonte. I hope you can see the bottle. Nascetta, N-A-S-C-E-T-T-A, -T -T okay? Beautiful uh, variety that back in the days was mostly used for the production of uh, sweet wines. Um, because of it, uh, very, very nice acidity and also aromatics. It's what we would call in, uh, uh, in our kind of classification a semi-aromatic uh, variety that has kind of an intense aroma on the nose. Then you have another one, I'd say one of Tommy's favorite, uh, the Timorasso. So Timorasso, also another variety that was almost disappeared, uh, brought back to life from a producer whose name is uh, Walter Massa. Definitely, if you can, we have the Ricci in house, but definitely, if you can, try some of uh, uh, Walter Massa. If I call him anything, it would be Walter and not Walter. Uh, but Walter Massa makes amazing uh, Timorasso. I had the honor of doing a vertical of Timorasso not too long ago when I was in Sicily for a um, uh, trip with my ambassador friends. And uh, we did a vertical of Timorasso starting from 1990. Uh, to current vintage, so up to 30 years old uh, Timorasso. We're talking about a white grape, okay? So definitely a great native variety of uh, uh, Piemonte. Then talking about international variety, here, here's Pio Cesare, great, great producer. Uh, and he, for example, has plantings of uh, Chardonnay and he makes uh, this beautiful Lange uh, Chardonnay which compared to a domestic one, a little bit crispier, they do use some oak, so there's little bit of um, um, oakiness, uh, so some, some characteristic that uh, might remind you of the domestic Chardonnays, but definitely you can feel and taste the difference in, care, in terms of uh, soil and uh, microclimate. And then going to the red varieties, again today we're going to talk about Nebbiolo that can be produced in a very youthful uh, version like the one we are tasting today. Um, and I choose that to, uh, first of all, because of the price point, it would have been hard to put in the uh, bundle on the kit for today about Oro Barbaresco. Uh, but uh, definitely Nebbiolos, Lange Nebbiolo or Nebbiolo d'Alba would be another appellation. They are youthful and ready to go wines that you can enjoy uh, right, after, um, um, that right after they get released from the winery. So you, uh, but Nebbiolo also makes the age worthy big wine. So the Barbarolo and the Barbaresco. And I have a couple of bottles here to show you. So here's Barbaresco from Produttori del Barbaresco, very famous producer. Ettore Germano, where you have the word Cerretta, which refers uh, to the single vineyard. Remember I said that Piemonte is the area that uh, should remind you the most uh, uh, about Burgundy in terms of the division. Uh, among uh, different crews, different vineyards. Really, Italy is a place where you move like a few meters away and you get a completely different soil composition, okay? Possibly not a completely different kind of climate, 
but in the same vineyard, uh, you might find a different kind of soil composition. The, therefore, uh, the grape that that wine is made of will develop a different kind of uh, characteristics. Okay, it's already 5.50, so let me go a little bit quicker on this and let's start trying our wines. But uh, to finish, the other red varietals that are deserving of a mention are Dolcetto, Dolcetto great variety. Uh, this is gonna be the variety that produces wines that are much inkier in terms of colors with a bright acidity and uh, lower tannins, okay? As uh, Barbera. Barbera d'Alba, beautiful food wine. Beautiful food wine with great tan, uh, great acidities, but normally pretty silky tannins, okay? Um, or you can have field blends like this one, La Maggiorina. Beautiful. We love this wine, Le Piane. Uh, so here uh, you are in a different area of production outside of the Lange, but in this case you have like a field blend. So I'll, pretty much all the native red varieties of the Piemonte are in this blend. Those are all wines that we have at Solare, so if there's any of those that tickled your fantasy and you may be interested in trying, let us know. I'm definitely recommending you to try the Nascetta and Timorasso if you want to learn more about native grape uh, of uh, Piemonte. The price for both these bottles until we have them in the uh, in the house, are, it's 25, just so you know, if you want to call us and get a bottle of Nascetta or Timorasso, we have some available for $25. I'm gonna take one second. Ciao Keiko, thank you for joining. Another friend from Italy. Who else do I see here? I'm so sorry that I, I, I can't talk. Ciao Nico! Nico Damo is one of my colleagues up in San Francisco. He sells wines for Villa Italia, like me. So I'm also taking, I don't know if Lorenzo is there, but uh, he's the owner of the Villa Italia um, wines. Uh, he's been doing this since 1990, importing a great, great wines uh, from Italy and I'm one of his uh, team members that helps sell his wines uh, down here in San Diego. So ciao everybody and ciao Curzio, thank you for joining. Lovely have you there, ciao Jeffrey, ciao Jeff. I hope you got the kit, okay? And I hope you can taste with us. Uh, and ciao Pietro. So Pietro is my good friend from Temecula. He has a restaurant up there called Trattoria Toscana where I once a month go and do guided tasting with his, uh, his friends and uh, customers. So if you are not very close to Solari, but you're located a little bit farther up northeast, uh, great Italian food, uh, Trattoria Toscana in Temecula. Don't forget about Pietro. Go there and say hi. Um, and check them out on uh, Instagram, Facebook. Uh, you'll find everything that they're doing in terms of takeout program uh, right now. You should ship your wine selection to Montreal. We should. Uh, I know some of my producer, that's I think it's Suk. Ciao Suk. So happy to have you. Just so you know, some of the wines I represent are actually already distributed in Canada. So I'll be more than happy to send you the portfolio and you can look at the producers that um, we represent and uh, support them. They are all great, uh, authentic, uh, uh, how would you say, that's how Lorenzo selects them. They are the farmers. They are the uh, traditional winemakers of Italy. That's kind of the, the uh, I would say, the theme on the book of Villa Italia, which, is, uh, which I'm very proud to represent. Um, also, I'm gonna take a second to show you this, so you know what's coming next on Thursday, so you can be prepared. And I'm mostly saying this because um, if you're not located here in San Diego, but you still want to do uh, take these uh, short classes, you can still try to get one, uh, both the wines that we're going to try or something similar to it, at least the same variety, okay? So the next session on Thursday is going to be about uh, other regions of Northern Italy. We're going to focus on Lombardia, Valle d'Aosta and Liguria, and we're going to try a wine from Valle d'Aosta, uh, which is going to be Maiole Bays, one of the native variety up there. Uh, so if you find a red wine that has uh, at least 50% of Maiole in it, you may want to try that with us. As per the white, we're going to try a Lugana Classico. I'm going to write those two names down for you. Give me a second. In the meantime, if you have questions, go ahead. So, 
Maiole for Valle d'Aosta. And uh, we said Lugana for Lombardia. I'm gonna show it to you so that you have a visual. You can write it down. I'll hold it one second while I get a sip of wine because I'm starting to be thirsty and I forgot water and everybody's outside there running, doing takeout. So not sure who I can ask some water. Oh, Randy came in. I can ask him some water. Next Thank time you come in, I'll love a glass of water. Absolutely. Okay, so, ready to go? As I said, um, I wanted to cover, so today might be, we might, might go a little bit um, above our time, a uh, couple of things about tasting wines. Um, first of all, remember those important five S's. So, the five S of tasting wine, okay? And those are C, swirl, swirl the glass, sniff, sip, and flavor. Sorry, savor, okay? So those are the five S that you wanna remember. That's kind of what you wanna do um, when you taste the wine. You start from looking at that, then you swirl, you sniff it, you sip it, and then you analyze it uh, in terms of the flavor that stays in your mouth after it. Yep, done that. Okie dokie, so the five S. So let's start with uh, everybody. Is everybody ready with your wines? I'm assuming so. So let's go ahead and start with our Gabi, okay? Any questions before I move uh, to tasting the wines together? Please tell me if there's any questions about what I said so far. Covering Piemonte in 20 minutes, it's impossible. Uh, there's so many things to say about this region. Normally, in a real wine class at a professional level, I think Piemonte might take two classes of three hours each. So forgive me if in half an hour I wasn't able to provide you uh, too many information, but at least you know where the region is located, you know the main wines, and then feel free to contact us if you'd like to deepen a little bit of your knowledge and get more information about this region, we can set up something separately about that, okay? But let's go ahead and pour our Gabi. So, I said it at the beginning of the class. Does anybody remember what's the actual name of the grape that goes into Gabi? I'm gonna start writing it down, but I wanna see who remembers it. Stefano Poggi, you don't answer. I'm looking, I'm looking. Okay, three. Oh, okay, he's a mayor, got it. It is correct. The grape that goes into Gavi is Cortese. Okay? Kirches. Uh, uh, Cortese. That's where the name comes from. Does that make sense? Any questions on that? So, Cortese is the grape, Gavi is the name of the wine, and it refers to the area of production meaning that the wine is made around the town of Gavi. Now, if you have your map open and you can see where that is, is the, the area of production for Gavi is developed around the province of Alessandria in what's called in Piemonte the Monferrato area in terms of wine production. So this Gavi that you're having, I'm gonna put the bottle right here. I'm gonna give you some information about the winery and then uh, please jump in, uh, start smelling it Start looking at that and make your own assumption. So you want to judge the color. Is it pale? Is it, is it, is it deep? Is it straw? Is it, uh, is it golden? Does it have any green reflection? Does it have any secondary colors? So you start from looking at that and then you start smelling it. And I want you to do an experiment and I'd like you to try to do that with both wines, okay? First, just take a sip. So take a sip with me. Without smelling it first, swallow it, which is like what you would do when you're out to a bar and you're drinking a glass of wine or you're out for dinner. Right? That's how you taste the wine. Now, how much do you remember about it? Don't answer, but remember this experience. Remember what you just did. Just take the glass, 
take a sip, finished. Remember how much you're able to remember when you do this. There's nothing wrong, you're enjoying the wine and drinking it, but tasting wine, it's one level farther. So, now, instead, yeah, no, I said we're gonna go a little bit longer today. Uh, so now instead, swirl, start by smelling it and taste it again. And then tell me how much more you can actually smell and taste in this wine. So that's a very fun experiment to do as this one. So you've done that one, I want you to do this thing too, okay? Because I want you to understand this is the first class and then we're not gonna repeat this every time, but I want you to understand how much your nose has to do with what you actually taste. So now take the wine, but taste it like this. Close your nose. Did you taste the same than you did earlier? Curious to see what you say. If people could not get wines in time, sorry, I'm taking, while you're doing this experiment with your nose uh, closed, I'm looking at questions. If people could not get wines in time, Cortese Gavi, are there any grapes, wines that have similarity, history or style? Um, good question, Stefano. Um, I, I found Gavi to be pretty, um, uh, to have a very strong identity. Uh, if I have to give, and please jump in, Stefano. I mean, definitely it's not an aromatic grape, so like, many other white grapes in Italy, you're not gonna find a huge nose on a Gavi. It's normally pretty neutral, moderate, delicate, I'd say. Uh, in terms of this specific one, just to give you some information, while you, I hope you did done the experiment of tasting the wine with your nose closed. I'm curious to see if you understand how much your nose has to do, meaning going back to that for a second, then we'll go to the specific of the Gavi. Again, when you drink, you're tasting with your nose, not just with your palate. Actually, your palate has a lot less sensory ability to recognize the wine than your nose. It all has to do with what you taste here and what you taste in what's called the ret retronasal tasting, which is right behind your uh, throat, okay? It goes back to your nose. So that's really important and fun. Um, so um, this is all stainless and steel, absolutely no wood. Um, what, do you, what did you think? I want to see some thumbs up. Do you like this, Gabby? Um, in terms of what the winemaker uh, says about this, uh, it's definitely a delicate wine. Uh, you're going to find possibly some uh, stone fruits such, such as peach in this. Uh, maybe a little bit of melon and pink grapefruit. A little bit of flowers notes, like mostly white flowers. A little bit of anise, maybe. And then we're running out of time, so I have to go to the Nebbiolo. So, pardon me, but we need to get out of the, we need to finish this life. Unfortunately, I have to let you go. So I'm pouring myself the Nebbiolo. Again, this is Michele Chiarlo. And I have, we have a document uh, about today's, uh, today's class with more information about Piemonte and information about the two wines we tasted. So if you'd like to get that, email us and Randy and I will email it to you. So Nebbiolo, the most important grape in Piemonte, not in terms of volumes, not in terms of how much there's planted of it, but uh, in terms of uh, importance of the wine because it's what it goes in Barolo and Barbaresco, okay? So this is Michele Chiarlo, very important uh, producer uh, of uh, Piemonte, 100% Nebbiolo, also in this case, so mono varietal <laughs> wine. Uh, this one sees uh, a little bit of wood, but not too much. It's a young, again, a biolo. So what you, are, what you can drink pretty much starting 12 months after the harvest, which is not the case for Barolo and Barbaresco. So, but it still gives you a lot of uh, important characteristics about the grape. So my expectation is that you're gonna find uh, aromas of roses in this Nebbiolo. Um, this is just to give you some hallmark. You're gonna find cherries sour cherries, you may find some tar when it starts to age a little bit, um, and you, I mean, and the, all the hallmark of Nebbiolo. This is a very, very good, typical uh, Nebbiolo d'Alba. So the, when, if you try this uh, uh, Michele Chiarlo Principe, you kind of know exactly what to expect. Color is a beautiful ruby red. Um, 
Sometimes you're gonna get nebbiolo that are more toward garnet color, that mostly happens with aging, but you may find that also in youthful young nebbiolo. Always a little bit of a rim variation where the wine touches the glass that can be a little bit more garnet and brown. You guys tried it? Anybody ready? Acidity, acidity, acidity. You understand? That's a big hallmark for uh, Nebbiolo. It's what makes your mouth salivate. Have you felt that when you get a sip? Looking if somebody had a sip with me. We taste jam, candy and cherry. Yes, that's all good. The jam is gonna go, that jammy notes will go down with the aging of this Nebbiolo, but it could be there uh, right off the, it's pretty, it's pretty young, I mean, it's a 16. So I think it's ready, it is a 16, did I say it right? Uh, no, 17, so this one could possibly reach his, I think it's actually now, toward a very good place where you wanna drink it, but it might be a little bit more balanced and lose a little bit of the acidity in about, uh, one year if you ask me to judge it but definitely the tanning structures is there and cherries yeah cherries would be the predominant fruit flavor in it oh yeah this is nebbiolo any questions because i'm gonna have to let you go very soon so if there's any questions, let me know. Otherwise, uh, we'll be together again on Thursday at 4.30 for, let me show you this again, class two with Valle d'Aosta, Lombardia and Liguria. And the wines for those who haven't got them yet are available. So call us later today or tomorrow to reserve your kit. Love the aroma, Pamela, yes, this is a beautiful Nebbiolo. Just so you know, all the, both the wines that you try today, we have them available. If you want to order more, get some to keep at home, let us know because we have them available. Any other questions? What is the suggested years of aging for Nebbiolo wine? Well, for our young Nebbiolo, I give it a three to five years. Um, when you talk about Barone Barbaresco, then you get from uh, release, uh, a minimum of five up to 20, 25, 30 years. I mean, and that would depend again on the producer, on the vintage. Um, yeah, so it depends. Looking if there's other questions. Otherwise, this is what we'll do. Um, I believe we're just gonna get out, but please email us, uh, contact us if there's any other questions about Piemonte, if you wanted to deepen your knowledge, if you wanna do something else with us about Piemonte, we are here. I'm now going to let you go because we promised to keep those short. And sorry if today I took uh, about 10 minutes extra of your time, but I want to go through those little tasting um, notes so that you could know what to do next time. And uh, I'll see you Thursday. Okay? Ciao, guys. <laughs>